Hey everybody, welcome to another hugely, bigly, epic episode of Stock Talk. My name is Amon Reyna and I am an investment coach and founder of Sage Investors. And as an investment coach, what I do is I work with and I help uh, new investors and experienced investors who want to become more financially independent, but just, just kind of struggle and I feel essentially intimidated and feel totally confused by this whole investing concept. They either don't know where to start in terms of investing, or if they've been investing for a while, they just, they're just not seeing their portfolios grow in any meaningful way. So what I do as an investment coach is I teach people, I engage with people on how to make more uh, educated, informed, and ultimately successful uh, investment decisions so that they can achieve that level of financial freedom in their lives and achieve it with a certain level of confidence. So that's kind of what I do. So welcome to Stock Talk. This is my little podcast slash video uh, program that I have here in this little corner of the universe where I like to talk about all things investing, talk about the markets, talk about stocks, talk about ETFs, what I'm seeing in the market, what I'm doing in the market in terms of how I go about making my own investment decisions, how I frame my own investment decisions, and sharing it with you. So ultimately, you can take some, hopefully, some of, this, some of these nuggets of information and insight might... Uh, might uh, resonate with you and you can take it back and look at it uh, and applying it in the course of how you make your own investment decisions. So this is episode 81 and today it's all about hypothesis. It's very academic, very ivory tower, but it's good stuff. Um, today we're going to talk about a couple of hypotheses that are one that has been around forever and one that's kind of new, fairly new in in the uh, in the investing community, and uh, but uh, it's kind of a variation on the old school one. So I'm going to talk about both of them, and offer some takes on it, and because uh, there's some really interesting insights that you can gain out of it that could help you frame um, how you look at investing and how you frame your investing decisions. So one of the things you do if you're going to study finance or you're going to study investing in, uh, in school and university is one of the things you learn that's kind of drilled into you over the four years of undergrad and whatever years you want to do after that is this whole concept, this uh, concept of the efficient market hypothesis, the EMH. And it's constantly, we go, I've take, I remember taking so many courses, investing courses, where this concept just you know, just kind of percolated to the top of any kind of uh, discussion or any kind of lecture. And it's, uh, and it's pretty dry stuff. I do remember falling, getting close to kind of passing out on it. Um, but it was, it was there and you kind of couldn't get away from it. So cut to the chase. What are we talking about? What's the efficient market hypothesis and why was it, why is it being drilled into, into our brain, into our investing brains? Well, the efficient market hypothesis is basically taking a look at stock prices and stock markets as a whole. And it's based upon, the hypothesis is based upon a premise that on two assumptions. And that one assumption is that people, people who are participating in the markets are rational. They make rational decisions. So if something um, bad happens, they will make an appropriate decision to react to that uh, bad event. If something good happens, they will make the appropriate decision to react to that good event. So rational, people will not make bad decisions. People always will make the right decision. Second assumption with the efficient market hypothesis is that all the information that on any company, on any stock or anything that's out the, uh, that about a stock or a market is available. Everybody knows it. It's no, there's nobody hiding information. It's all publicly available and publicly you know, consumable. So rational behavior and complete disclosure of information. That's what drives the market, uh, efficient market. Those are the assumptions that drive the emission, efficient market hypothesis. So what it tells us, the, the premise behind the whole thing is that if you have rational people out there making rational decisions and everybody knows all the information about anything related to stocks, then ultimately the price that you pay, stocks will price themselves accordingly, will, will price themselves based on these two assumptions. So ultimately what they're saying is that in an efficient market, in an efficient stock market, 
all the stocks that are in there and the prices of those specific stocks reflect all information out there. So nobody really kind of gets an edge, has an edge or has an advantage over somebody else or some other institution in terms of uh, figuring out where stock prices are going to go. Stock prices are going to go where they're going to go. And ultimately what it means is that it's really hard for somebody or anybody to outperform the market, generate returns that are, that are greater than what the stock market is currently generating. It's impossible to outperform the market. And so it's a really important theory in a sense that a lot of what you're seeing right now in terms of the whole passive investing movement, the movement where we're seeing here away from traditional portfolios, which were people just pick and choose specific stocks and build a portfolio or, uh, or a mutual fund. Um, people are switching away from that, which is a much more actively managed kind of strategy and basically falls on the premise that markets are irrational and that prices, people know more information than somebody else. So there's an alpha, there's kind of that gap out there. And so people are trying to exploit that gap. So what we're seeing in the markets right now, and especially in the investing industry, is that move away from that uh, inefficient market to this efficient market hypothesis. A lot of passive investing decisions, uh, you know, the most, most popular investment products out there are ETFs that manage, uh, that invest in broad market indexes or track the returns of broad market indexes based on, based on the premise of that, that you can't outperform the market. And the research out there have shown that when you compare passive investing to uh, ma actively managed investing, that passive investing over a long period of time does a better job of generating better returns than an actively managed portfolio. And this is the big kind of value proposition behind the whole ETF movement, especially the, you know, the traditional ETF movement. And uh, so that's what it is. And it's interesting, like, so, you know, when I was in school, I learned this stuff, it's beaten into your brain, and you come out of it with a degree, supposedly know something about investing, and you come out with this concept that, hey, everything's efficient, everybody knows everything, prices reflect that, move on. But then, you know what, then I started reading some books after when I got out of university. I read stuff up about Warren Buffett. I read stuff about Peter Lynch. And one of the most uh, amazing books that I've read investing is, is Beating the Street. And so these people, and there's other you know, legendary, legendary investors out there who have made you know, amazing amounts of wealth, both loads of money investing, um, they kind of are, challenging this whole efficient market hypothesis because if you can't outperform like how are these guys and i'm sitting here going reading these books i go how are these guys doing this but i was told that the markets are efficient that price reflects you know stock prices reflect all information everybody knows what's going on so it's impossible to beat the market but look at these guys buffett's doing it lynch is doing it the whole whack of people are out there are doing it there's something weird like so what they're saying and what these investors are saying was that, and when I read these books, I was going, you know what, they're basically sticking their nose to the whole efficient market hypothesis. They're saying, you know what, people are not rational because people are human beings and people have different opinions and ideas. There's buyers and sellers that have different attitudes and approaches to companies and stocks and investing. That's one aspect of it. That's what they're challenging. And the second part also is everybody doesn't really know everything. That certain people may have, and it's not because of ownership of information or privacy of information itself. It's just information is consumed at different in different bite sizes and different morsels. And so not everybody might have all the information out there to, to fully understand, engage in, and make an investment decision. A lot of times we're making investment decisions is based on educated guesses because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. So it's interesting because... Um, after I read, after I got out of school, you know, after having this EMH be beaten into me, I'm going, you know what, this emerging, emission efficient market hypothesis thing is just what it is. It's just a hypothesis. I don't think it's got any, it's grounded in any, any reality. So, and it's not just, and over time, what I've noticed though, is it's also, you know, the people that are really successful at investing are kind of ones that are developing these challenging, these um, these theories, but also the other side of it that's, I think, helping these people become better investors or 
people like Buffett and Lynch being the investors that they are, was they had a really good in tune understanding of the behavioral side of the psychology of the side of investing. So when the efficient market hypothesis came out, there was nothing about behavioral finance or behavioral economics or anything like that. That's kind of a very, very recent last 15, 20 years kind of uh, concept that's kind of in the play. So what's happened is um, there's people kind of, you know, looking really more into the behavioral side of this and kind of trying to see if there's some linkages with the, you know, the efficient market hypothesis and, you know, the behavioral side, try to you know, come up with some kind of linkage or some kind of uh, relationship with it. So there's one person that I want to share you with. Uh, his name is Andrew Lowe, and he's a professor at MIT. He put together, he tried to sit down and figure this stuff out. And he came up with kind of like a variation of the efficient market hypothesis. And he called it, he calls it the adaptive market hypothesis. And it's really focuses a lot on the behavioral sides of, you know, how decisions are made. And really, more, supposed to, more specifically, on how irrational behavior manifests itself and how it can really screw with our investing decisions. And so part of it is a little bit of biology in this side of it and understanding how our brains function. And so he talks a little bit about, um, and from, the, from you know, understanding what the brain, how their brain functions. And basically, what it, where, how it works, how it shakes down is that part of our brain is basically made up of irrational thoughts and part of our brain is got contains a lot of rational thinking rational behavior and so there's very um instinctual kind of things and emotional things about our brain that and that we're doing and these two elements this rational and irrational side they're constantly um fighting each other it's a, it's a constant tug of war there's a war going on 24 seven in our brains between the rational side of our, of our thinking and our irrational side of it thing. There's a, there's always kind of competing. So what he notices is that from his observation, from his perspective is that when you get into situations where, and especially extreme situations and bringing it into an investing kind of situation, when the markets are, for example, crashing, um, or if the markets are just surging, like setting record highs, like they are like these days, he cites that basically when people start thinking about investing in these extreme situations, they're going to be thinking more with the irrational side of their brain than the rational side of their brain. And they're going to be making decisions, more maybe impulsive decisions, more emotional decisions because the irrational side of our brain is taking over the irrational side of it. And what happens is, and according to Mr. Lowe, he says, what happens is, in these type of extreme situations, we get misperceptions. We get we, things that we perceive, we perceive them very differently and perhaps incorrectly. So he cites an example um, and he brings, and it's very applicable because it's what was happening down. He's like, he notices in his research that after extended long periods where there was no negative events or no negative kind of information, uh, essentially bull markets, um, what happens with people is that when there's really long periods when there's nothing negative going on around us in our investing in the investing environment, we tend to perceive that when there's nothing going on and everything's going fine, that there's less risk out there. And what that what that kind of um, stimulates us to do is when we perceive that there is less risk out in the market, we're actually going to take more risk. So if you bring it back to what was going on right now, we've gone on a period. There was a period where we went like. Oh my God, how many weeks, like a ridiculous amount of weeks where the S&P or 500 didn't go down like more than 1% or something like that. It was just some like 180 days or something like that. Some ridiculous like stat that I saw out there. And so when you have these extended periods, if you go a long period of time without a really a significant market event going on, you kind of will perceive to be things are cool. And you know what? Everything's good. Everything's awesome. And I'm going to go in and buy more stuff. I'm going to buy some more stock and willing to take on more risk. So what you're doing is taking on more risk. The reality though, and here's the, here's the kicker right here, and this is the thing that, and it kind of just dawned on me really, is that, you know what, there is no, um, with stocks, and this is something I teach with people, is that there's no periods where stocks are risky and there's no periods and, or periods where stocks are not risky. Stocks are risky 24 seven. There is a chance that any stock that you buy has the potential to go to zero. You could lose all your money. Stocks are extremely risky, no matter what, whether you're in a bull market or in a bear market, 
stocks are risky. And so if you perceive, you know, everything is going well and there's no activity going on in the market and the market's just kind of like chugging along, you know, going through the motions and you start taking on, you're buying more stocks, you're setting yourself up for a real hit because when the market starts to go down and go down meaningfully, that irrational side of our brain is going to kick in and is going to win out in, in terms of our decision making and it's going to help and it's, chances are we're going to make lousier decisions. And so this whole concept of Mr. Lowe talking about the adaptive market hypothesis is, is really about how our brains, if something keeps going for a certain period of time uh, and our brains kind of like adapt to it, then we kind of fall into a sort of uh, element of uh, an era, kind of a, a feeling of, a, of a false security. And we rest on our laurels and we get complacent. And that is really one of the most dangerous times as an investor is kind of dropping the ball, letting our guard down and saying, oh, you know what? Markets keeps going up. Oh, I'm just going to keep buying stocks. Oh, I'm just going to keep buying stocks. And so that's kind of what's going on right now in the market. We've got this kind of, we've had this incredibly long period of really, since 2009 and since the Federal Reserve started dropping rates to practically nothing, we've seen an incredible surge in asset prices. And it's gotten to the point now where it's kind of expected. Markets are setting records on a daily basis and it's just becoming the norm. And when things become the norm, we adapt to it. And so this is where the adaptive market hypothesis comes. We adapt to these situations and we assume these uh, events to be normal when in fact they are just as risky as any time of the market craps out. So I find that really interesting that he's brought this kind of behavioral component um, and brought it into this kind of understanding of, of how the behavior side of our biz, of our of our thinking and how we make decisions really can influence, lead us down a really bad path. And so what are the conclusions are of, you know, what are the conclusions here? So, you know, we have the emission market hypothesis based on rational behavior and you have this adaptive market hypothesis, which is kind of fronted on irrational behavior. So, you know, is one better than the other? Is one more superior and one is one right or one wrong? Well, the answer, for me at least, is like anything in life, it's in between. I think there are merits to having, you know, um, uh, from an efficient market. I think there are times where the market can be efficient. And there's times also where the market can be inefficient. And unfortunately, we can't time these events. We can't like, you know, set our, set our watch to when the market is gonna be efficient and when the market isn't gonna be efficient. But we can at least be, as investors, aware of these situations. So right now we've gone through an incredible period where market stocks have been going up and up and up. It's been an incredible boom for people who have, uh, for who it's been like right now the, the efficient market hypothesis folks are winning the battle big time. And this whole concept of uh, all information uh, outperforming uh, markets, it's really hard to do. So passive investing right now is really doing its thing. Now that's not to say again that the adaptive side of it, the ir- dealing with irrational behaviors, isn't realistic or isn't out there. It's very much out there. And of course, there's people out there that are exploiting that and doing that. So as far as I'm concerned, I think there's value in both elements. I think there's nuggets of information that we can take away um, from both of these type of hypotheses. I do think they serve their purpose. I know a lot of people, you read a lot of people, it's they're very much, it's either you're passive investing, you're believing in efficient market, markets, or you don't believe in efficient markets. It's either one or the other and you have to like pick one. Well, I really think as investors, it's about absorbing information and understanding concepts and perspectives that's gonna help us make better investment decisions. And so I think there's a little bit of nuggets of value that can be derived from both sides, the behavioral side and the non-behavioral side. And it's interesting, I wanna end it, end this little uh, talk a little bit with another kind of anecdote that um, Mr. Lowe actually cites in some of his research. I don't know if it's Mr. Lowe himself, I just read this in, a, in another article somewhere else, but uh, I don't know who said it, but somebody said it and I didn't make it up, so I'm gonna give whoever else is the credit for it. And talk about the whole concept of, of wearing seat belts. Now, the premise being, you know, we, when you get in a car, you put on your seatbelt, right? Because, you know, you don't wanna get in an accident. But the reality is, if you've never been in an accident, and you keep going in the car and you're putting on your seatbelt, you could easily say, you know what, I don't think I really need to be in a, wearing a seatbelt anymore because I've been in an accident. I haven't been in an accident, so you know, I don't need to be, I, I'm just gonna take it out. 
And to me, that's kind of Mr. Lowe's, another way of Mr. Lowe's uh, explaining the adaptive market hypothesis, is if you do something for so long, for so long, for so long, you adapt to it and it becomes a norm and you kind of get complacent and say, hey, you know what, I don't, I don't need to really do this, but that's really kind of the worst time you want to be dropping your guard. And uh, so it's really important, even though, so going back to, this, to the, to the seatbelt, even though we know we should, we, we feel, we think in our heads, I don't really need to be wearing the seatbelt. We still keep the seatbelt on, right? Because the reality is we don't know if we'll ever be in an accident. So we keep that seatbelt on because um, we've, what we've done is we've kind of adjusted our thinking. We've adjusted our, our framework. Because think about it. Imagine when seatbelts came out. I remember growing up, uh, you know, I don't remember wearing my seatbelt all the time in a car because it was just not instilled in our thinking of, of what could happen. And, and, you know, it wasn't proven that seatbelts could really save you from a car crash. But now, look at how we live now. Like, you wouldn't think about not getting in a car without wearing a seatbelt. So, again, it just shows how our adaptive thinking can influence us on our ability to make decisions. And it could be for the good or for the bad. And it depends how our brain is thinking from irrational to irrational. So the key takeaway is, as long as we're aware of our behaviors and aware of the biases out there that can influence our ability to make investment decisions, if we're aware of that, chances are we're gonna be able to manage them better. And chances are we're gonna control it and we're not gonna make as many bad investment decisions as we potentially could if we let emotions and let irrational behavior kind of take over our decision-making process. And so I find this stuff really cool and this is the kind of stuff I teach uh, in, my, uh, in my practice. I have a module in my everyday investing course where I teach people how to you know, make better investment decisions, figure out how to buy and sell stocks, where I have, a, I have an entire module de dedicated to understanding these behavioral biases that screw with our decision making. And I teach people how to manage those behaviors better. So uh, it's something if you're interested, you can check out my, uh, my everyday investing program. It's on my website, uh, sageinvestors.ca. So interesting stuff. I'm gonna have lots more to say about this behavioral side because I'm really, I'm really, I spend most of my time now when I work with people and teach people investing, uh, coaching them really about controlling their behaviors and managing their behaviors, instilling discipline, instilling a framework in how they make decisions because that's really the secret sauce. To me, it's the secret sauce that separates run-of-the-mill investors from really, really, the really kick-ass kind of investors. So something there I'd love to share with you. I'd love to hear your inputs on it. Are you do subscribe to one or the other efficient market or adaptive market, rational behavior or irrational behavior in terms of how stock prices are set. Love to hear from you. You can send me an email uh, or Twitter, uh, DM me on Twitter, at Sage Investors. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear some insights from people on it. So that's all I got for you on that. So what else do I got? Um, announcements. Just wanna give you another quick reminder that my next webinar, and it's a free webinar, is coming up on Tuesday, June 27th at 12 noon Eastern Daylight Time. And the topic I'm gonna to be talking about is beginning your investing journey. As I said, one of the things I do, I work a lot with is, I love to work with is people who are new to investing, who, who know they should be investing, their parents are getting on their case to buy stocks and build a portfolio and start growing their savings, um, but they just don't know where to start or they have been, but they just haven't been getting an attractive. So this webinar I'm doing on, two, on the 27th is really gonna talk about how to find your investing path and how to find an investing path for you that's gonna allow you to make, uh, be more successful in making investment decisions. Because it's a critical component, especially when you're starting to invest, um, is trying to find the path, the right path. Because there's so many different ways you can go with investing. You can do it for your, by yourself as a do-it-yourself investor. You can hire somebody and outsource your decision. Um, to manage the money on your behalf. You can hire now computers to manage your money on, on, by, on your behalf. You can buy stocks, you can buy ETF. There's so many different products out there. So what I'm trying to do in this webinar is just kind of give you a little bit of clarity um, to get started and kind of give you that kick in the butt to kind of get you started investing and just making sure that you can find your investing path. I'm gonna share some insights there with you and uh, share, share some opportunities that I can have uh, to work with you to help you find your true investing path. Because once you're on your right investing path, once you have the competencies that you've been to develop to make better investment decisions, your chances of you know reaching that element of uh, financial freedom 
are pretty, I think they're pretty much in your favor. So it's on the 27th. If you're interested, just go to my website, sageinvestors.ca. There's a uh, registration page right on the homepage. You can just drop in, just drop, just drop your email and name, and I'll send you the contact information, the login information, so you can connect up and, uh, and listen in. It'll probably be about an hour long, so just it's basically your lunchtime. Um, and I think it's really important. I really, I really actually enjoy, I've given this uh, uh, talk a couple of times now and each time I really enjoy giving it because to me this is just, this is the stuff that I think people are looking for um, when they wanna, uh, they know they wanna invest and they just need to figure out what path I need to go. How do I get this thing going and get it going in the right direction? So if you're that kind of person who's kind of looking for that direction, and looking for that starting point or looking for that you know kick in the butt to get you going this webinar is definitely for you so i definitely recommend you check it out and uh, i'd love to have you aboard and i'd love to share some insights with you on getting and finding your investing path um that's pretty much about it if you have any questions about this show this episode or any other episodes and you just want to ask me some questions about investing i'm more than happy to answer them you can hit me through my website sageinvestors.ca just uh, drop an email through there, or I'm on Twitter all the time. I'm always commenting and sharing in real time uh, my observations about the stock market, about individual stocks, investing concepts as a whole. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Again, my handle is at Sage Investors. So that's all I got for you this week. Uh, yeah, that's all I got for you this week. I hope you have a good week. I hope you're making some good investment decisions. Thank you for blocking a little bit of your uh, time out to, to listen in. And I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen, uh, listen board. Um, feel free to subscribe to all my other previous episodes on iTunes or through my website. And feel free to leave comments and reviews and likes and stuff like that. I'll be all, it's all good. I'm just trying to spread the word. Um, that's it, that's it. That's another edition of Stock Talk. My name is Amin Reina of Sage Investors and we'll catch you again another time. Take care, cheers.